Hello, everybody. If you can hear my voice, type in yes or why. There we go. Good stuff. All right. Okay, so uh, before we, uh, if any, just a reminder, if anybody has any deals or anything they want me to review, you can send it to me now. I'll review it on the call. And other than that, uh, nothing planned, so let's open it up for questions. Anybody have anything that they want to discuss or talk about? Questions? <laughs> Barriers, things that are maybe you're you're finding challenging. Thing, how are the classes going? How are your your on demands? Any questions about any of the material you're reviewing or seeing? Oh, good, good. So that was. Uh, that was momentum, yes? Good, good. Okay, a couple people typing, <laughs> Wait, waiting for for questions. How are things going? What uh, what what? I got a good uh, reference for my power team. He's working in that this week. I got a good reference for my power team. He's working in that this week. Okay, good. Good. Okay, yeah. Keep 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 uh, asking questions. You know, how are things going? What are you finding working for you? Anything that's challenging? Okay, <laughs> a lot of people typing. Okay, here we go. I wonder how many real estate investors the city can carry before all good deals are taken. Okay, um, really uh, the, the type of real estate opportunities uh, that were uh, learning about obviously a real estate deal with the right numbers a good deal is a good deal but really what's driving those those opportunities those good deal are, are really uh, people problems people are, are going through a situation or a challenge and um, that's what's causing the opportunity for the real estate deal as, as the property itself becomes a problem or part of the problem for the seller so an example would be someone uh, going through a divorce uh, the property needs to be liquidated that creates the opportunity someone's been downsized uh, someone's going through a foreclosure so really the there is no limit uh, to how many opportunities there are there because uh, fortunately or unfortunately uh, people problems will never stop happening so there's always going to be people that are going through uh, something and because real estate is a staple and that we all need it, uh, that creates the opportunity as real estate becomes a problem for people when they're in rough situations. So to answer your question, Philip, they really don't go away. Now the market, uh, and we've talked about it lots of times, uh, several times about the market and how the market moves and, and what the market's doing. And I don't know if, if you've heard recently CMHC is is going to start opening up to to uh, insuring 30-year mortgages. Anybody hear about that? Yep. 
So we and we yeah we've talked about this. We've talked about this. Um, when the market because the market so the market right. So when we look at the market, the average appreciation we know is it's more like five and a half, up three six percent. The market, what the market we've seen the market do um, is the market now is retreating. Um, so it was rising up and now it's starting to retreat. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to keep this line as flat as possible and go up just based on inflation. Um, so what they need to do is, is uh, do something to allow uh, the property values to stabilize or rise at a slower rate. They created all those new rules, the stress test rules, to, to actually flatten the market, to make the market you know, stop going up because it was going up too high. So it was going up. So they created the, the stress test and the new mortgage rules and that flattened it out or to pull it back. And now the concern is, you know, is it is it going to is it going to go right down? Um, they don't want to see that. Obviously, they're trying to control it. So there's a couple things they can do. They can drop interest rates, which is a challenge. Uh, you know, you can't, you can't go less than zero. We're not at zero, but the interest rates, you know, going lower and lower creates a challenge for the for the Bank of Canada uh, and managing the economy. So they really don't want to uh, lower the rates or they want to avoid that because the rates are at a low, low level now. Uh, continuing to lower those rates will be a challenge if something serious happens to the economy. So an easier uh, method uh, to, to uh, allow uh, the market to stabilize or even start to rise is to extend uh, what CMHC will, will finance for you because a 30-year mortgage um, versus a 25-year mortgage has a, has a huge impact. So to, to give you an example, you can look at that. Give me one second. So to give you an idea of, of the impact of that little change, so if we just look at, focus on the, the uh, mortgage amount, let's say um, that someone can afford, they run through the mortgage rule, you know, the mortgage rules in their, their application, and let's say that the person can afford, right here, afford, it's less than afford, afford per month. Per month, what can they afford? Let's say they can afford fifteen hundred dollars. Okay, so fifteen hundred dollars a month is what they can afford for a mortgage, and that's really how it works. They they find out what they can afford, and then they decide you know what mortgage they're gonna have. So so this is the area I want you. The monthly payment is what I want you to imagine. And we're talking about a 95 and a 5% ratio, right? First time home buyers, right? So if we look at this at 95% at 3.5, and really the rates are, you know, you can get a, let's say three, right? Or a little bit even less, okay? So when they look at what someone can afford, um, we can look at here, 300,000. So if we look at uh, 300,000, and the we're going to look at the purchase price. It's going to be 300,000. Okay. Um, it looks like so they can afford that, right? That's a 25-year mortgage, 5% down, 1,500 a month they can afford. This is 14, sorry, 13,487. So you'll be pre-approved for let's see, go to 350. Let's see, zeros. Okay, so that's a little too high, so maybe 340. Nope, still too high, 330. So this is what they're calculating, right? How come? So you're about 330,000. That's what you can afford. Okay. Now watch what happens. So 330 is the max you can be pre-approved for, right? So what if we change this to 30 years? Look at now they can afford a 300 and let's try 360. 
Yep, taking over 360, 365 maybe. Nope, 370. So we were originally at 330, around 330. So 370. So so now all of a sudden the person, the same person can afford a $370,000 house instead of a $330,000 house. Okay? So does everybody understand what that's a major impact that that amortization 30 years? Okay? And you know, at one point, you know, it was even 35 and 40. Imagine it was 40. Um, all of a sudden that $330,000 house now be sold for more than more than four hundred twenty thousand. So yeah, let's see if we can go actually four hundred thousand more. Okay. So so from going from twenty five to forty, all of a sudden the house could be bought worth hundred thousand dollars more. Uh, would you be concerned about the overall leverage? Uh, no. Actually, we would like this to be even bigger. The bigger the better for us. Um, we would rather have less money in than, than more money in. Um, so, so because that increases our return and requires less to participate in, in the property. Um, give me one second. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mentioned it before. More cash flow, yeah. No, cash flow will go down. Your cash flow, the more money you have in a property, or sorry, less money you have in a property, your cash flow will go down. But the cash flow, and this is why we have, you know, you need cash flow. You have to have cash flow. There's no point in having a property that you have no money in or any money in that doesn't make you money. So there has to be uh, a level that you acceptable level. And that's where we, you know, multi-unit, we're looking at 75 a door. So you want both. You want the return and the cash flow uh, in, your, in your real estate deal, for sure. So you do want that. But typically, we, you know, to to allow us to participate and extend our money as far as we can, the less money we have, the better, as a rule. So um, the overall leverage, we we like to see more leverage, right? Good leverage, obviously good leverage. It's, this is good debt that makes us money, and uh, allowing those those mortgages to extend actually should create a bump in the market, uh, and or at least stop it from, from bleeding it, you know, rolling over, which which it's been doing the last year or so. So uh, this is a response to to you know leveling out the market and allowing it allowing it to 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 continue to move up. And by not reducing the interest rate, it actually the banks don't like low interest rates. There's not a lot of money for them to be made at the low interest rate level. Uh, I think I even got something in the letter about mortgage rate being 286 or 256, 289, 289 I think it was, 289. So, you know, these little things, you know, they create an impact too. So if, let's imagine they went to 2.5. Um, all of a sudden that $430,000 house, we go back to even, uh, you know, 40 here, which is where, where, where it is. Uh, if I can get this down to 255. 2.2 Oops. 2.2 maybe. Let's see. I'm up a full. Yeah, so 2% 2, 2 rate would, would allow that $430,000 house. Now remember this started at 300000 $330,000. Now a 30 year at 2% will still allow me to afford this $430,000. So this is another way to to prop up the market. Um, is it good for the economy? Is it good for the market? Uh, I think you know for sellers definitely this is a good thing because you remember I mean as it becomes more difficult for people to get mortgages, um, it's harder on the banks, right? It's harder on the banks to lend. They want to be able to lend, right? That's their business model is to buy and sell debt. So they 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 want the ability to get those loans. If the if the market itself stops you know, the, the values are at a rate which cannot be, people can't get mortgages for, obviously the market has to come down. So so we start to see deterioration of net worth of the country, individuals' net worth starts to drop. Uh, I have a family member who's selling a house, personal residence, and uh, if he would have sold his house two years ago, he would have made another 150000 to 200000 more than what he's, sell what he's selling for it now. 
So that's that's a, that's a serious impact, you know, on on, on the ability to uh, cash in on on what you've done or invested in a property. And this property is actually better now than it was two years ago in condition. And um, that's the reality of the market. So so the market has rolled over. Not everywhere. I mean, there's areas that are you know on the rise, but as a as a you know general, the whole country we're down. We're down. Uh, last I checked, it was five and a half percent. Might be, might be uh, a little bit less now, but it's it's something that you know the whole country is experiencing. So this 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 extension of the 30-year mortgage will definitely have a positive impact uh, to the market for for sellers. For buyers, um, not so much, right? Uh, because the buyers are gonna be are gonna be charged more or asked for more. Uh, on those properties, so it's a big deal. It's a big deal that the, the mortgage rates have, have changed, and shifted, or they're they're, shi they're shifting. CMH is sharing it. That's a big deal. So uh, when we look at the when we look at the market, and what we're looking at, we want to make sure that uh, we're understanding the benefits uh, or of the rules that are existing, and, and how do we participate and get the most out of it. I'm coming to an option to buy my business partner for higher than the average market multiple, but because I own majority shares, so cash flow is still even better because I can finance it for 12 years instead of 10 years. Although the although I'll be buying them much higher multiples than the average multiple multiples, that's over leverage too. Yeah, that's 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 it. I mean, if you're getting if you can extend a mortgage further, you can you can do more. I mean, if this is if this is you know uh, you know 50 years, you know all of a sudden that $330,000 house can probably go for let's see 600,000. Yeah, 600,000. So you know each time we extend the mortgages and the ability to uh, to uh, to do that, that's going to allow us to. Uh, allow us to get more or asking prices start to rise for the same property. But this is the reality that you have to recognize that property values that this tells you the property values are not real. They're they're a fiction, right? They're the market's deciding what a property's worth. Is that property, is that value static? Is it will it ever go down? Obviously that's not true. It can go up and down and it will. Uh, at the end of the day though, uh, I was having this discussion yesterday actually was you can't ask people to, you know, pay uh, more than they can afford, right? So if somebody can only afford $1,500 a month, that's what you're working with. Uh, you can't change that. You can only change the interest rate. You can only change the, the term of the mortgage. You can only change, you know, things that are going to affect the monthly payment. But if the person can only afford $1,500, that's all they can afford. Uh, that doesn't leave you uh, the ability to do much with the market unless you use these other tools like interest rates and amortization schedule. Uh, if that individual, you know, can only, and think about this, okay, so let's say that the individual increases by 4%, okay, and let's say inflation is 3, okay, so so that's, that's how much more uh, a month this person can afford year over year, you see that? So if this person's increasing their if their income's increasing four percent, like that percent, then then each year monthly, well you know what can they afford monthly? It's going to go up by this four percent. So we take this times this plus plus this gives us. So that's what they can afford more per year. So if a person's income is only going up, and that's I use four percent only because you know the assumption is, on average inflation is around three percent. So real net 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 income increase is really one percent. It's really only going up one percent because um, even though your your income might be going up four percent, really all they're trying to do is match inflation. Really the the cost of living increase. Um, so let's say the cost of living went up four percent, then fifteen sixty. Let's say the person can afford for fifteen sixty. So 60 more dollars a month. So, so the question becomes, how can a property uh, continue to go up, uh, you know, 10 and 15 percent at a time when incomes are only going up, you know, uh, 
one percent net net, but let's just say four percent cost of living increase plus the one percent, fifteen sixty. It's just it's unsustainable. So at some point, uh, the market has to retreat to the average. The average is um, six percent, five point five around that percentage, uh, and that's really uh, caused by the fact that people's incomes only rise. Uh, about 1% a year net net and the fact that it costs you money to own a house, right? It costs you uh, the taxes every year, the insurance, the maintenance on the property. Uh, those things cost you between 4 and 5% or even higher in some places. Um, so there's not much left over in actual value because all that money is going into your house just for owning it. You don't, you know, it's not like that money comes back to you. You don't get to charge that on top of the list price. Uh, that money is absorbed by the house and Net, 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 you're only walking away with, with maybe 1% a year on the property. So, you know, that would take you 72 years to double the value of that property. It would take about 72 years to double the value of the property at 1% return. So, uh, that's a, basically a lifetime. So, uh, not a great investment. Obviously, there's the risk of uh, when you're investing at 1%, not a good idea. And the risk of, obviously, the market going up and down. When are you selling? When are you going to do it? Nobody knows where the tops and bottoms are. So this is a big, big deal, this 30-year 30, 30 amortization. It's something that we should take advantage of and will make an impact to allow us to get a higher leverage point and the ability to uh, produce higher returns uh, and, uh, and more opportunity out there for us to stretch our money. So very big deal, the 30-year mortgage extension. Will we see 35? Uh, I think so. I think we'll continue to see the market. Uh, unless something uh, happens uh, in the current trend, I would imagine that, uh, you know, in a couple of years, you could see 35 um, and continue to see the mortgage amortization extend uh, longer and longer to protect the real estate market. Because if they don't do that, the only other option is to reduce the interest rate. And, uh, you know, when you're in the range that we are for interest rates, uh, there's not much more you can go down before you put the economy at risk. Uh, because if something does, you know, if we go into a deep recession, uh, you can't go less than zero. So, you know, uh, there are countries in the world right now, uh, in Europe, uh, and Japan uh, is famous for it, negative interest rates. And this is something that's seriously being considered by the United States and Canada as an option. And negative interest rates means if you put money in the bank, uh, they'll charge you interest. They'll charge you interest for savings, basically. Uh, they'll, they'll, loans will be near zero, you know, for for lending money. You know, it's it's not a, it's not a good thing to see negative interest rates, but there's times where um, it's a tool that the World Bank's use to try to stimulate the economy and create um, money flow. Because if the money's not flowing, that becomes a problem. So um, it's important for us. It sounds like a tax. Yeah, I mean, it is. It is. Uh, you could, you could argue that it's a tax. It's, it's a tax for saving. That's for sure. It's a tax for saving. Savers are, are really getting punished. Um, you know, if you're on a fixed income and you're, you're buying bonds uh, and your bonds are producing a 2% return or 1% return, I mean, unless you have millions, um, you're, you're not going to make much money. And, and the, you know, GICs and, and uh, banks are not offering much uh, in the way of it because the interest rates are so low. Right, so it's a serious, serious problem that can spiral out of control if things go wrong. The other, the other uh, problem and opportunity, uh, something to keep in mind: the population is aging, so there's the area of opportunity of uh, assisted living properties, homes, uh, is going to be a big thing. I think rooming houses, it's emerging right now, uh, and as people get older, they spend less money uh, on consumables and uh, and uh, that, again, becomes a challenge because the economy is driven by consumption uh, and people buying things. And uh, the area of opportunity for us is, is the assisted living. The economy is going to have to figure out how to get uh, people who are aging to spend more money because that, you know, that can be a serious problem. That's the experience that Japan has had. Their population is aging and living longer and longer. People are saving more and more money, and that, that's really what has Kill their economy. Kill. No, that's not the best word. Stagnate their economy because nobody's spending money. So you need you need you need people to spend and consume money. You can't 
can't save your way to wealth. That's unfortunately not a not a realistic plan. You know, money's money's true essence is, is to flow, and there has to be velocity of movement of money to, to, to grow it. So, uh, inflation in Canada and the United States is pretty low. Uh, not a real big concern about inflation, uh, which is good, but you don't want inflation to be zero because that would be bad. That would mean no growth and no expansion. So, assisted living and domicile. Yeah, for sure. So, so, um, I think that that you you respond to what the market's doing or saying. Um, I think that's 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 what you want to do. Uh, take advantage of what's there, what's easy, what's the market giving you. Give me one second. Just, uh... Okay. Sorry, just looking at a student student email here. I thought it was that. Does anybody want me to look at anything while we're on? Just checking my email right now to see if you guys have sent me any of them. Sam, I was discussing about people aging and retirement centers, a good place to invest, but it seems that the average elderly get goes to a retirement center at the age of 80 to 85 years old, and given the medicine progress will keep going. People will tend to go to retirement centers even later. Uh, yeah, uh, that's that's absolutely right. I mean, retirement retirement is, people are living longer. So is there really a good deal to invest in retirement centers? Yes. The, the, the baby boomers is the largest population, uh, as far as I know, in our history, uh, birth rates, group, you know, uh, generation. Uh, they're all aging now. They're all going into retirement, uh, and you know to facilitate that uh, or participate in that. Yes, I would tell you. Yeah, there's there's opportunity there. There's opportunity there. So, you know, uh, as an individual investor, a rooming house set up with with the assisted living uh, would be would be I think something that would be something that you could come into uh, relatively. Uh, easier than trying to go into a you know a, a retirement community. Either or obviously is is an advantage. I'm just I'm looking at you know the the ability for you to participate easiest and quickest would be probably the assisted living. Does that make sense, Frank? Good, good. But if they go to those centers at a very advanced age, I, I don't, I don't know what the, I don't know, you know, life expectancy. I don't think has changed that much um, for people. I think it's, you know, relatively grows a little bit every year. Uh, you're right, medicine is is helping extend life, but I think that the 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 participation uh, in the economy is still, you know, pretty much the same. When you get up in those years, retirement years, uh, the retirement, where you live or, you know, uh, if you go to those retirement centers or you do the assisted living, I think both of those are going to grow exponentially as, as people, as time goes by. So uh, I don't think you're going to have a problem finding people who need help or need to participate in the assisted living. I mean... Uh, retirement communities too will grow huge, huge. They have been. So yeah, I think either one is, is a good opportunity. Sometimes if disabled or other uh, reasons for care needed. Yeah, that's right. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I think that that's more of what the market's going to drive. You know, uh, we can look at the macros like aging population, like interest rate changes, like, uh, you know, amortization, insurability of CMHC, uh, those things will impact the market. The other area that I think that you want to become, because anyone can really participate in that because it's the market doing it. It really doesn't take a lot of skill because you're not the one driving it. I think the other area that we want to, we want to look at and really, really uh, expand on is, you know, uh, people problems. 
uh, downsizing, death, uh, you know, divorce, uh, you know, uh, you, you know, even a, even a disaster like, like Fort McMurray with the fire or the floods in the mid Midwest, uh, middle uh, mid mid Canada. Uh, those things can create the other opportunities. Those are th those are things that are, all, you know, constantly going to be happening. I think that. Uh, you know, downsizing. Those things are the areas that you want to really get good at is, is solving people's problems. That's how you get paid. You really get paid. Uh, and the most money is when you're when you're helping somebody out of a jam. I was thinking about more investing in retirement resorts like people living at the age of 65 will live and enjoy longer. So you may want to invest in resort projects so you get a piece of their buying power. Yeah. I think though, Frank, unless you're running the project, um, that's where the real money is. Investing in the project, uh, you know, you'd have to, you'd have to be a, a pretty good, pretty good opportunity. I was with a student um, in uh, the U.S., uh, Montana, actually, and and they they were looking at a deal where it was a development project, and. Uh, they were looking for him to invest. Uh, I think it was three million, uh, and he was going to get uh, six percent return plus participate in the project. Blah blah blah. You know, uh, it wasn't a horrible deal, but it was a lot of money to be putting up for a, a low rate of return of six percent. So uh, I can't remember the exact percentage it was, but when we analyzed the deal, it wasn't good. This is uh, about a couple months, it was a few months ago. Anyways, the point being is is uh, because he was the investor in the project, he wasn't the one actually developing or creating the project. The return on that individual is much less. Does anybody know why? Why you would expect less if you're the investor in the project, uh, you know, a development project? I'm not saying, Frank, there's an opportunity there because there is, but why, why would we get less if we're not running the project? There's a fundamental reason. Less risk. Um... I think actually that that the, the 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 builder has the least risk to tell you the truth. The create the, the 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 you know the developer has the least amount of risk. That's why he sells into it. You're the bank. Uh, yeah, you are the bank. But but there's a reason that you really don't make much in these you know or as much as you could. Right? There's not a decent return. Uh, no sweat equity. Yeah, I think you're 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 touching upon it. Uh. It really comes down to this, and, and that's really, you know, sweat equity might be, might be, uh, uh, you know, prelude to it. Uh, the reality is, is putting up money is really not a tat, not something important. Like money's everywhere. I mean, it's, you know, just putting up money in something and expecting to make a great return, it just, it's not real. And I know we wish it was. For those who have money, uh, they, they, they would love it if they could just put the money up. And, you know, the old, old uh, you know, line goes, you know, it takes money to make money. Uh, that's that's only not even a, I wouldn't even call it a half truth. I call it a little truth because, you know, even having money doesn't make it easy to make money necessarily if you don't know what you're doing. So putting up money into a project, uh, you can expect to make a ton of money. Um, and and uh, it's because you're not doing anything special. Anybody can put up money. Money's there's there's no nothing special about that. So uh, although you know if you're the developer and you need the money, it's it's a big deal. But at the end of the day, you're really not doing anything special. So you can't expect uh, to get paid for doing something as, as simple as putting up capital. So um, if you want to get more, you, you got to do more. There's no really really uh, way to say it other than that. And and obviously we want to work smarter uh, with with our money and extend it. Uh, you know, I, I have somebody right now, I had a lender come to me, uh, and if anybody has an opportunity that they, they're looking for capital, just recently a lender came to me and asked me uh, to to uh, to use some of his money. He's got money and he wants to he wants to put it out in the market. And um, so, uh, you know, he's 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 looking for his is he's looking for 10 percent is what he's looking for. And and, uh, you know, 10 percent for him. Because uh, the money's just sitting there doing nothing would be great. And 10% for for uh, an investor uh, who's investing in property would be great too. It, it works. When you're dealing with, with huge projects, 
uh, where there's money coming from everywhere, uh, that money's competing for for growth and, and opportunity. And these margins that these developers are working at are, are not so massive that they can offer you know huge returns. So you know um, for people who don't know what to do with money, I mean a six percent looks pretty good. Looks pretty good. Ten uh, percent would take you. 7.2 years to double the money. 6% would take you, what is it, 15? Is that right? No, wait, 12? 672, yeah, 12 years. It would take you 12 years. So uh, it's 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 not quite double the time, but it's it's get it's up there by going from six to 10. So uh, compound, compound uh, interest compound returns are pretty important. That's how real estate is assessed. Our properties are assessed on appreciation, which is really compound return on investment, um, and, and and that's that's what people are looking for. Unfortunately, people who are not skilled with money, uh, maybe high income earners as they come into money, they don't know what else to do. So if you want if you want more, you're going to do more. This is why you become a valuable asset uh, for people because you can take money and make more money from it. So. And most lenders, most hard money lenders, uh, a lot of hard money lenders would just say, don't, don't actually use your own money. So they facilitate the deal. So uh, if you want to make serious money in real estate or get return of it, you want to participate more. I'm not saying don't get involved in lending. I'm involved in lending. I like lending. Uh, but you know, the bigger, larger returns are always going to be the guy that's that's on the floor that's doing the work, uh, that's making the deal work. So. Uh, I guess, I guess you want to be on on every on every front taking taking the opportunities that come to you. So I would say you know in reference to investing in development projects, again just assess the numbers. If it makes sense, wonderful, do it. If it doesn't, then then don't. But I wouldn't expect too many of them to give you huge return. In fact, many many uh, there's some, some companies out there that uh, there's companies out there that that what they do uh, with their students is they sell them inventory. Uh, they sell them properties. Um, they're connected with builders and stuff. But those returns, they wane over time. Like right now, all those companies are struggling now because the you know real estate is is rolled over. So what can you legitimately offer an investor who's putting up the capital? So there's not a lot of room for for growth or, or profitability to share when the market rolls over because because they will factor in appreciation. This is why we don't. It will factor in appreciation and capital pay down in their numbers. And if I'm if I'm putting in capital pay down, in other words, uh, principal pay down, my apologies. So as we're paying down the principal, if I use that as part of my numbers and I use, you know, appreciation rate, you know, every year it's going to go up six percent. Then then it's going to it's going to make the property look better than it is. And and uh, you know, it's it's you can't control appreciation. Now capital appreciation or capital uh, pay down. When you're paying down the, the principal of your property, the renters are obviously you can you can account for that, but, you, but really it's when you're talking about 20-year mortgages, 25, 30, 40 year mortgages, if the capital appreciation, capital pay down, principal pay down. My apologies, it's it's relatively small. It really is relatively small compared to uh, the other things that are factored into it. But it's it is your money. You will make money there for sure as as the renters pay down uh, pay down the property. Any questions about any of that? That was a lot, a lot of info. No one good? I'm not good, huh? Wow. <laughs> okay. So does anybody, anybody have any questions about the sheet or, or anything they want to, they want to cover on the sheet? Something that they're, they're trying to understand? Um, I want you to, you know, recognize the value of the opportunity of that. You know, to be able to quickly evaluate properties, that's really what this is about. And I remember what? Some of you might remember, somebody mentioned that they remembered me talking about this in the class about, you know, the mortgage rates being extended. Um, you know, people don't realize, I think, because we have a lack of financial education, uh, what these things mean. Uh, some of you, might even be too young to remember when when mortgages were 30 years, you know, or 35 or 40, even, where you could walk into a bank and actually get uh, financing, uh, huge financing, 
um, even even a line of credit attached or builders builders loan relatively easy when the market was hot. Can you tell us about how you found, realized that the deal would work and how you followed through? Sort of like example. Sure. So, um, so uh, most recently it was a wholesale deal. It was a wholesale deal. A wholesaler uh, offered me a property. That's that's how the last one came. Um, another one was some are just listed, uh, but they're not listed. They're listed. They're like pocket listings. So it was a pocket listing, distressed. The property that's another one was. Uh, just thinking most recently, a partner, uh, another investor came in and asked me about a deal and wanted me uh, to come in with them, rehab. Um, so all of those, uh, come, they come from different places. Uh, the follow through uh, and the work that, that I think is important for you to know, Philip, is, is that um, you want to be able to run your numbers and make sure that, that there's money for everybody. Really, that's what it comes down to. So... Um, you know, once you have an opportunity, once, and I think the other one that I really want everyone to consider or look at is partnerships. I mean, it's much easier to get partnerships and participation from other investors, um, you know, uh, to, to, to allow you to participate because, you know, 100% of, of zero, right, is trying to make a deal happen on your own uh, versus 50% of something is, is obviously where you want to be. So, I think the main thing you want to do is you, you want to be able to say yes to all good opportunities uh, and you got to put out offers. Um, you got to, you got to, you know, you got to be running numbers. Uh, you know, how many, how many properties are you running uh, a week? Are, you know, are you running at least, you know, even if you're running five a week, three to five a week, I mean, that's, you know, if you're running five properties a week, every week uh, for the next year, I'm telling you, you're going to find a property. You know, if you're, if you're putting out, uh, you know, uh, you're putting out uh, marketing, depending on the marketing you want to do. And, you know, I'm not a big, big, huge fan of social media and stuff like that myself. I don't really get into all that. But however you market or what you feel comfortable with, um, all those things, banded signs, those things will, will help you. Uh, Kijiji ads, if you want to put a Kijiji ad saying we buy houses as is, all those things will attract property. You can't say necessarily uh, where that next deal is going to come from, um, but you want to be able to say yes when it does. You know, you want to be able to say yes uh, when the opportunity comes. So uh, I think that that for yourself, what you want to start with is simply, you know, evaluating properties and putting out putting out offers. Um, how many of you have put out offers? Actually, put out offers. This is to the group. Not yet, okay. Good, Mike, good. Good. Not yet, okay. Still have it, not yet, not me. Okay. Haven't found anything that looks good. Okay. All right. How about we? Do this. How about we focus on putting on an offer in the next 30 days? How many of you would be interested in doing focusing on that in the next couple of sessions? Let's just put out let's 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 work on putting out offers. Let's do that, okay? Let's do that. Yeah, let's do that. We need we need you can't do properties if you don't put out you can't you can't find you know you can't do a deal if you don't put out an offer. So this is what we're gonna do. We're going to everybody has the conditions, right? The conditions of the offer. Everybody good. Everybody has that, right? This right here. Terms and conditions, everybody has this. You don't have this, I want everybody to get this. This document.
this is what I want for, for everybody to do. I want everybody to have, we'll do this for next week, but find everybody have an offer to purchase contract, an offer to purchase contract. So an offer to purchase contract, so that's a standard real estate contract. And I want you to have the terms and conditions that I'm, I'm opening up right now. Okay, so everybody have that for next week. I want everyone to review the terms and conditions of Schedule A. I want to re review it. Uh, make sure... Uh, let's see, actually, second, Just reviewing that for a second. I want to see if there's something I can. Okay, let's do this. Everybody this week, everybody have, everybody's going to find a property to put an offer out for next week. Okay, we good? Everybody's going to find a property that they want to put an offer out on, okay? Then Tuesday, Tuesday, we're going to put that offer together. Okay? Okay, that's the commitment. Everybody's going to find a property, even if it's not the best property, but a property that we want to put an offer out on. Even if they say no to us, who cares? Who cares? It doesn't matter. You can't do property if you can't put out an offer. So we need to put out offers. Okay? So we're all going to put out an offer. Uh, we're all going to find a property we're interested in. Everybody's going to put out an offer. Uh, uh, we'll talk about the offer next Tuesday, but by next end of next week, uh, let's put out an offer. How's that sound? That, that'll be our goal. So by the end of next week, we're putting out an offer. Okay, let's do it. Let's get committed to that and excited about that, okay? It doesn't matter if they say yes to us. Don't even worry about it. It doesn't matter. You know, it doesn't matter. But the process of putting out an offer is fundamental to our success. And if we don't do it, you know, and the longer we wait to do it, you know, we can't look for the perfect deal, right? We got to look at potential deals. And if they're an opportunity, we're going to put out an offer. And I want you to get comfortable with putting out offers. Know you're protected. And if the deal works out, it works out. So I want you to be able to evaluate a property and shoot out an offer, okay? So next week, uh, have a property that you're interested in and actually let me just does everybody have the intent the intent email everybody seen the intent email the email that we use for an intent to offer does anybody know what I'm talking about okay hold on So give me one second.
Well, that's right, but I wanted to view. Hold on, sorry about that. So in a letter of intent or an email of intent is basically you saying, look, I'm interested in your property. Please. Okay, so we can use this one. You know what? I don't want to bring that up now. No. Because <clears throat> it's, it's basically the, the clauses that we have in our contract and you send it. I want to do the exercise with you next week, okay? We're going to do it next week, okay? So I uh, have the old one back in April 10. Okay, so the letter of intent is basically just saying that the property, I'm interested in your property if you're, if you're interested. I'm interested in your property. Um, this is what I'm interested. This is my intent to, to to produce an offer. Please add these clauses to the offer and send it back to me for signing. So basically, you're you're putting in an email, you know, to someone. I'm interested in this property, and this could be a realtor or a seller. I'm interested in your property. This is what I'm asking. This is my offer price. This is my VTB price. This is my, you know, uh, you uh, the. Uh, VTB interest only versus VTB principal and interest uh, and obviously we're giving different prices for those so uh, let's deal with one at a time let's let's so the letter of intent because I I want to give you the the one I have is it's it's okay let me see I wonder if it's the same one you were talking about so letter of intent I have it here here so it's there everyone can grab that one Go ahead and grab that one. It basically just says, you'll see it. It says, look, uh, you know, please add the below clauses to the offer of the purchase contract. Purchase, and basically it's those clauses, financing, verification, event rents, expenses, property viewing, right to show, insurance covered, and approval, right? This, this would be, you just throw that into an email and you can send it to them to add to the contract, or you can add that after the fact, right? But this right here has no, you're not, you know, it doesn't show us putting the actual price or what we want or willing to offer on the, the property. Michael, does that one have the, the, I offer, you know, I'm offering this amount? The one you're looking at, or is it the same as this one? It was official one from the from the profile. Oh, okay. Um, no. As an example, okay. Okay. Michael, email that one to me. I want to. I want to see that one. I can't see it visually now. I want to see the one I got. I had for that. I want to see what it looks like. See if it's the same one because I keep pulling up this this same one. Can you know that? Okay. Let's see.
Michael, you just sent it. Good. So that's the deal. Find as many properties as you can that you want to put offers on. Okay? As many prop because the format is exactly the same. The format is exactly the same. So once you've done the intent to email and or just put the uh, offer to purchase on the property, uh, you know, uh, through the standard offer to purchase with the addendum, the appendix A or appendix B, whatever you want to call it with conditions, you're good to go. You can send out the offer. They could say no. But the, the activity of you putting out that offer is important, and this is what we want to work on for the next couple of weeks, okay? All right, good. All right, any questions before we wrap up? Okay. We're good? Good, good, good. Good, good. My pleasure. Okay. All right, folks, if you're good, type in yes or why. Good, good, good. All right, have a good week. Okay, but let's remember now, we're committing to finding some properties we want to put offers on, okay? This is the deal. We're putting out an offer in the next couple weeks. Let's do this, okay? Doesn't matter if they say yes, doesn't matter if it's successful. Who cares? The activity, I want you to feel confident putting out the offers so you can feel confident when you see an opportunity to jump on it, okay? Don't get bogged down with, with trying to overanalyze. If they say no, they say no. Who cares? We move on. But we don't want it. We, we can't spectate. We have to participate. Okay. Awesome. All right, everybody. Have a great week. I'm looking forward to next week's session. I'm excited about it. Next Tuesday, uh, make sure you show up with some opportunities and we'll go through the, the intent to offer as an example. And we'll talk about the terms and conditions of putting out that offer. All right, folks, have a great week. Good hunting and make sure you come with some properties. Okay. Doesn't matter what it is. We'll do